I've never spoken to this many people, so uh, I'm glad you all look nice. Uh, as you can see, I'm getting my hair back, which is good. Not all of it's coming back, uh, which is a surprise, and it's uh, darker than it used to be. Um, and as you heard, uh, my wife and I are from Florida, and in these lights, I'm sure I look really pale, so that's probably hard to believe. Um, yeah, it was May 18th, uh, 2007, when uh, I got the news. I was in a doctor's office, an uh, oncologist, um, and he told me uh, what I had. And, uh, you know, you've probably heard the stories when uh, people hear the word cancer, how that affects them, everything comes to a halt, that kind of thing. And I have to say that things kind of came to a halt in my life, but uh, I wasn't scared. And uh, I wasn't upset. As a matter of fact, my wife and I tried to joke with the doctor, we made each other laugh, we were trying to joke with the doctor in the office and he uh, didn't seem to really have a sense of humor. And so we left there, I, I had asked him and an what I think is an important question and I said, if you were me, what would you do? Because he had told me, you know, basically I had about three months. And he said, if, if he were me, he would go someplace where they were experts in exactly what I had. And so that seemed kind of daunting, if the clock's ticking, to try and track down and find where to go. So we left the office, and we were both calm. We didn't talk in the car, and I, I called my dad on the way back to work to let him know what had happened. And when I got back to work, that conversation just kind of bothered me the rest of the day because he sounded sad, upset. And so I, uh, I waited until I was on the way home from work and I called him on the phone and uh, he and my mom were both listening and I said, uh, I said, I, I wanted to remind you that it's not really important where this ends up. The most important thing is how I walk between here and there. How I make the journey. So I, I noticed on the insert in your bulletin, my name's on there under cancer. And uh, that's a humbling thing to have a church you've never been to, people that have never seen you and your name's there. And I'm sure some of you have prayed. And there's a lot of churches like that. My uh, in-law's church and my brother's church. People that have never seen me praying, emailing me, sending me cards. And probably something that they're praying for is for healing, uh, for me to be, you know, to survive and be healed of cancer. And those things are nice. Uh, healing is good. Um, and surviving longer, you know, it's been 11 months now. Those things are nice, but they're not necessary. The most important thing, what was required of me, was my obedience. And what has been necessary for me over the last 11 months has been my surrender. So let's talk about surrender. I uh, was sitting in clinic one day and I... My wife was sitting across from me, and between the chemo cycles in the hospital, your counts drop. Uh, lymphoma is a blood cancer, so your counts drop, so you have to get transfusions and platelets and things like that. And so she's sitting across from me, and I was reminded of a story that I read in college. 
And so I told her about it, and the story was called uh, Fear and Trembling. It was written by a guy named Kierkegaard. He's a philosopher. And he, uh, he wrote the story twice. The first one he wrote of uh, Abraham, the traditional story of Abraham taking his son Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him. And then he wrote the same story again, but this time he inserted himself in place of Abraham. And so he calls Abraham a knight of faith. That when Abraham was asked to do what he was asked to do, he took his son and he headed toward the mountain and he surrendered to God right then. So the whole way he was obeying, but it wasn't out of duty. He loved God. And so he was giving him the gift that he was giving back to God what had been given to him. But in the second story, Kierkegaard puts himself in, in that place and he says that he would have been the night of infinite resignation, which, which basically means he would have quit. He would have, out of duty, obeyed God. And that whole journey up to that mountain, he would have cut himself off from that gift, from his son. He would have cut himself off emotionally. He would have ended it, okay, this is over, this is done, I have to give this back. And where you see the difference is when they get to the top of that mountain. And when Abraham raises the knife and his hand is stopped, and God says, your son is yours. And there's a, another sacrifice waiting for him in the bushes. He can receive his son back with joy. Because he had believed, he had trusted the whole time. But Kierkegaard says, if that were me, and he stops my hand, well then I would be ashamed because I didn't do it right. I'd walk that whole journey out of duty. I had undertaken the whole thing to obey, yes, but I hadn't really trusted God. I thought I was losing by doing what God wanted me to do. And so whatever the ending in my life was going to be or is going to be, whether cancer was going to take me, which it doesn't look like it will, I'm in complete remission, or because my immune system's down, I can get an infection and die, whatever the end result, I want to make sure that I walk from here to there, believing, trusting, I want to do it right the first time. I don't, I don't want to cross the finish line and look back with regret and say, man, God, I, I wish I had trusted you all that way. Cancer. I want to make it clear that God didn't give me cancer. I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, the God that I serve, that you serve, I believe is a God of order. He's a God of creation. He produces. He sustains. He's perfect. And cancer is none of those things. Cancer is chaos. It tears down. It destroys. causes pain not only hurts the individual, but it hurts everyone around them, relationships, family. So cancer doesn't come from God. However, my first thought in that car ride back to work was I was thankful. Not that God had given me cancer, but that he allowed me to get it because um, the statistics are something like, I don't know, one in three or one in four people will get some form. And so if I had it, then that meant that two or three others weren't going to get it. That seemed like a blessing. And then there's obedience. 
the uh, I got saved in uh, 1996 in the spring, and I had been a uh, well, I guess a restless wanderer. I had been I had tried to be an atheist for about three years, and uh, so I had nothing to do with church. I'd been away, and I came home one night. I, it, on a Monday, I checked out a book from uh, the library. It was a theology book. I wasn't just an atheist. I was proactive. I like to argue with religion majors and Christians and things. So I picked up a theology book to do some research. And it was a Saturday night. I, I waited tables, and I got home about 2 in the morning. And so I went to bed, and that book was on my nightstand, and I just, I was kind of restless and bored, and so I opened up the book to a section called Nothingness. And I started to read, and the Holy Spirit came into my room. And, um, I had to slide off the bed. because I felt like I was up too high. Excuse me. And so I got on the floor and I laid on my face. And uh, I didn't see him and I didn't hear him, but with my heart's eye, I felt like he was right there in front of me. And so I'd been gone long enough that I didn't remember the sinner's prayer. But in that moment, it was a natural progression of, uh, I had to recognize who God was. And I had to confess who his son was. And what he had done for me that he died, that he rose, and I knew he was alive because he was there. And then I confessed who I was. And everything came to a halt. Because the next point, I felt like he was extending a gift, which obviously was grace, and I, uh, I didn't want to take it. Because to receive that grace, I would be forgiven. And after those three years, I didn't deserve it. And so I wrestled with that for a few hours. And so my conclusion, two hours later, was uh, that I could not resist him for the rest of my life. It was too powerful. His love was too strong. It was overwhelming. I couldn't, I couldn't resist. So I either kill myself then and end it all to receive what I have coming or I accept the gift. And my conclusion was that I had already heard him enough that I couldn't hurt him anymore. And so I gave him me. So fast forward. That was 96. You go to op October of 2006. And I'm, I had made a deal that night with God that uh, we had to go slow. We had to baby step because I was, I had been cynical for so long. I, I couldn't change everything. I, I really, I tried to go to church after that, and I, it felt foreign. I didn't really gel with the people. We didn't have the same interests. And so that night I made the deal with God in the beginning, before any of that happened. We've got to baby step it. We've got to go slow. You've got to set one thing in front of me, and I'll work on that one thing until I get it, but that's it. I can't do it all. 
and baby stepping over the next 10 years got me pretty far. I was, you know, a good guy. I was a board member at my church, a greeter at the door. I was pretty good. And then in that fall, there was a business deal with this, a guy from a couple states away that I'd been in church with, a friend of mine, and I was going to lose some money. A good sized amount of money. And to let that go was going to mess up my life, to me, my perception. And so the longer I couldn't get a hold of him, the angrier I got. And I had to do something. And the old Craig was still there. I, I wanted to get even. I either wanted my money or I wanted to mess up his life. And so I, I, can, I could, at the time, get creatively destructive. And my juices got flowing. And one particular day at work, I was so consumed with it that I left early for lunch and I was heading home to put some stuff in motion. And in the car on the way home, the Holy Spirit just asked me a question. He said, what if? What if you forgave him? Maybe some of you know how it feels when you're that angry. The word forgive is not something you want to hear. But the Bible says you have to count the cost, and so I started counting the cost of what, what that was going to cost me. Not, not just money, but could I live with the reminders? How would I react and feel every time I thought of it? Would I be able to let it go? Would I be able to forgive him, and then later afterwards I would remember and get angry again as I was reminded what this guy had done to me? And so after doing that, I arrived at the conclusion that I couldn't forgive him. Similar to when I got saved and I couldn't accept the gift. But this time I said, God, I want to obey. I want to forgive. But I can't do it, so you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to change my heart. You're going to have to come in and do the whole thing. And he did. He changed me. He changed my instincts. And it probably looked funny. A guy my size in a small car driving down the road crying middle of the day. So... If I hadn't obeyed that day, October 2006, I had baby stepped up to that point, and all of a sudden in October 2006, I took a big boy step. I took a, a big stride. And if I hadn't done that, I would have never been ready for May 18th, 2007. Because after that particular day, it was like dominoes fell. All of a sudden, it was like my knee-jerk reaction to obey. Big and small things, it didn't matter. That was my default. It wasn't a question. And so I got to May 18th, and I wasn't afraid. And I'd learned how to surrender. Last thing I'll share with you. Uh, there's a lot of tests, obviously, you have to go through. One particular test, very painful. For me, anyway. For some reason, every time before the test, the doctor and nurse like to discuss the last person that felt nothing, and they were surprised. I guess to let me know not to yell or something. I don't know. And so... Uh, I had had the test the first time uh, when I was first admitted the week of May 23rd. 
and uh, it was really painful where they went in with the first needle was right where all the pain from my disease was. And so two months later, three months later, they were going to do it again. And so I was in clinic and they were, they were giving me platelets because my platelet count was real low and before they stuck me, you know, I needed to be able to handle bleeding. And so the test was creeping forward. It was at 2.30. It was about 12 that I was sitting in clinic. The test was at 2.30, and I was at the end of the room where I could see out the door across the hallway to where I was going to have to go. And as it got closer, I just couldn't cope. Um, my pain tolerance was gone. I couldn't handle any more pain. And thinking about that test, I had no idea how I was going to get through it. And my dad was sitting across from me, and he asked me what was going on, and I couldn't even speak to tell him. And so the nurse came walking down, and she looked at me and asked me what was wrong, and I just told her, uh, reschedule. And she didn't question me. She just, she did it. So all of a sudden, I had a big weight roll off of me, and I was excited, and it was a pretty day, and I just wanted to leave with my folks, and get something to eat. But two days later, that test was still coming. And so sometime before that test arrived, I had a thought, what if this time, as bad as it's going to be, what if when I go in that room, I don't think about me? What if I, uh, what if I don't pray for God to help me or strengthen me or knock me unconscious? What if I just praise him, rejoice? What if I, right at the height of the pain, thank him for everything he's done? And so then I had a mission. Now I wanted to see if I could actually do that. And so the test came and I went in the room And so that time came when the pain really was heading to that unknown crescendo. And it was at that point that I wished that I had prepared something beforehand because it was hard to concentrate. But I, I did it. I thanked him. I praised him. I didn't think about me. I didn't say, God, hell, I, no, none of that. Now, nothing miraculous happened. I, no angel choirs. The pain wasn't any less. But from then on, I started doing that in all those uncomfortable situations. And it wasn't until this past January that I realized what exactly was going on. And I read a uh, passage in a book. The book was called uh, Away With Words by... Dr. Bowling, he's the president at Olivet. In the chapters, each chapter is a word, and in the chapter on gratitude, he tells a story in there about a Methodist minister in Ohio. Have you told the story? All right. He tells a story about a Methodist minister in Ohio who, uh, for years, had visited a jail every Sunday after church. He'd gone to this jail to minister to prisoners. And at the same time, he and his wife had been saving up. Their dream was to go to the Holy Land, go to Jerusalem. So they'd been saving their money. And the prisoners knew this. And year after year, the guy you know, showed up there after Sunday services. And finally, the day came when they had enough money to go. So he was excited. So he tells these prisoners about it. And as he's leaving the jail, the prisoners all crowd around him. And they hug him, and they pat him, and they jostle him. And then the crowd parted and he started to head for the door and a prisoner stops him, has a box in his hand. And he said, you know, we couldn't afford to get you anything. This is all we had. But don't open it until you get home. So the guy's touched. So he goes home to his wife, tells her the story. They pull on the string and open the box and inside the box is his wallet and his keys and his pen.
And so that's, that's really what we do with Jesus. That's what I did when I prayed through. I didn't have anything to give him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, uh, what do you have that you have not been given? What do you have that you have not received? And so all I had to give him in return for grace was the life he'd already given me. And it wasn't even in as good a condition as when he gave it to me. So when I got the opportunity to walk into pain, that was my moment to not ask for anything else. To just surrender and thank him for everything he'd already done. And I'll, the reason why I wanted to come here and share that with you today is because I was in your bulletin. And I know people here have prayed for me. And I just wanted to say thank you.